from people who believe that they will live forever according to their perspective, a science fiction author who believes his stories are real events that took place in another reality, to some speculating that there is life on one of Jupiter's many moons, Europa. All this and more are coming up next. Hey, Ariel for the Valus channel. Today, we look into some fascinating entries that range in intensity, from aliens to Spanish conquistadors. I hope you enjoy the selection of research and topics on this iceberg. Consider subscribing to the channel if you enjoy my work, and checking out my Instagram and my Twitter for updates and as a backup in case any of these videos are ever taken down. Let's get started. Atacama Skeleton The 6-inch long, 16-centimeter skeleton remains of a humanoid were discovered in 2003 in a Chilean village in the Atacama Desert. They were given the name Atta. The remains were later tested via DNA analysis, finding that the humanoid had unusual genetic mutations most often associated with dwarfism and scoliosis, though these findings were heavily disputed for a while. Researchers opposed to this claim suggested that the skeleton remains show signs of a normal-looking fetus in development, the only difference being that it wasn't human. It even made an appearance in the 2013 UFO film Sirius, in which they speculate that the skeletal remains are that of extraterrestrial origin. This caused such an uproar that Stanford University geneticist Gary P. Nolan contacted the film's production team and got a hold of the skeleton, concluding that the remains are human. Anatomist and paleoanthropologist William Jungers hypothesized that it was a human embryo that was born prematurely and perished before or soon after birth because of the open frontal suture of the skull and the incomplete ossification of the hands and feet. Although pediatric radiologist Ralph Lackman has stated that dwarfism alone could not have accounted for all the traits identified in the embryo. Nolan's alternative theory is that Ada had a combination of genetic problems that caused the infant to be aborted before term, giving the remains a distinct look. Researchers ultimately found 64 unusual mutations in the seven total genes linked to the skeleton, something they had never seen before. Keep in mind, these mutations have yet to be explored and studied as they were new to the researchers. Spanish Conquest of America Lie When thinking of the Spanish conquest of the Americas, you most likely see it as a mass genocide, with the Spanish being the evil invaders who spread disease and took the land. But it wasn't a clear-cut story as it's often referred to. Just like any civilization, there were already major conflicts and other complex issues occurring in the Mesoamerican region, involving war and leaders with power trips. So much so that the Tlaxcala people who were being surrounded by the Aztecs, the Mexica, decided to ally with the Spanish, of course after a brief battle with them, but ultimately supplying them with resources like food, fresh water, routes, and men to defeat and take down the powerful Aztec Empire, the Mexica Empire. Now let me get into the details. There were only about 600 Spanish men who arrived to take over the Mexica with a few horses. Most of the army used to take over the Mexica Empire actually consisted of the tens of thousands of Tlaxcala allies and other neighboring indigenous groups who had similar motives. Meaning without the Tlaxcala people, Cortes would most likely not have been able to conquer the Mexica as they were greatly outnumbered. It was actually recorded that heading west, Cortes and his men would come across natives of the area who would tell stories of the cruel treatment at the hands of the Mexica, the Aztecs. They knew that an alliance would benefit them both. After winning, the Tlaxcala were given what they were promised, rule over their own government and lands, and they were not forced to pay taxes, as long as they converted to Catholicism though. Thriller Album Cover Changed this is in reference to the pretty famous Thriller album cover by Michael Jackson, where he's leaning on the ground. Apparently, many people recall him simply wearing a black button-down shirt, with white or black buttons. But if you look at the album cover now, he is sporting a casual black zip-up hoodie. I guess this made its way onto TikTok, where people are arguing whether or not this is a Mandela effect. I don't have a preference for either one, but what do you guys remember him wearing on this iconic album cover? Solipsism have you ever thought that maybe this is all a dream? That you are the only real person in your universe and that everyone else is an NPC, a construction of your own creative mind? 
Maybe our own perception is deceiving us into believing what we see exists outside of ourselves, outside of our brains. But in reality, nothing truly exists outside of one's own perception. Solipsism is the philosophical theory that the self, you as a single person, the individual, are the only thing that can be trusted as real and truly existing, believing that even other human beings are illusions created by our inner consciousness. René Descartes, a French philosopher, arrives at only a single first principle, that he thinks. This is expressed in Latin phrase cogito ergo sum, the English translation being, I think, therefore I am. Descartes concluded, if he doubted, then something or someone must be doing the doubting. Therefore, the very fact that he doubted proved his existence. The simple meaning of the phrase is that if one is skeptical of existence, that is in and of itself proof that he does exist. I like how the simple idea of just thinking proves that we exist, but cannot prove that other things around us are real or are manifestations in different forms. This kind of thinking I believe is rather dangerous though, as it has led some down paths of alienation from those around them and could lead to the loss of empathy. What does your mother or father, family and friends truly mean if nothing were real and everything was a figment of your imagination? It would eventually drive someone crazy. Inca Skull Surgery When I think of the words ancient surgery, I usually think of the early days. You know, the 1800s type shit, when they had surgery theaters in which they would perform the surgery in front of other people, and the doctors wore suits. I highly recommend the television show The Nick. It depicts the early history of western surgery practices and really showcases how far medicine has advanced. But the 1800s wasn't the first time major successful surgeries were completed. Apparently, we can trace this practice all the way back to the ancient Peruvians. When digging up ancient Peruvian graves, archaeologists started to notice that there were openings in the skulls of many individuals. These ancient skulls revealed that the holes were deliberately made when the person was still alive and showed that they lived well after the surgery was performed. They would go on to find the instruments used to perform these surgeries as well, like the tumi, a bronze sharp knife used to make an opening in the skull, and other objects to probe inside, known as trepanation. The act was most likely part of a ritual. In 2018, a study came out showcasing the remarkable feats they achieved in surgery, as there was a 75-83% to 83 survival rate for those who had surgery during the Inca Empire, according to research conducted by the World Neurosurgery Journal. Those percentages even spiked higher to 91% when additional skull samples were found from the same time period, outperforming the 50% survival rate of trepanation surgeries during the Civil War era in the United States, some 400 years later, which consisted of very similar methods. Civil War medical records revealed that 46% of patients would die due to cranial surgery, as opposed to the Inca who had a 17% fatality rate. This of course isn't a dig at civil war doctors, as they probably had to deal with bullet wounds and other objects lodged in heads, but more of a highlight of the ancient Incas' a strange amount of knowledge on brain surgery, which ties into the whole hidden or lost knowledge theory, which implies ancient civilizations were far more advanced than we give them credit for. The Adam and Eve Story this entry is in reference to Dr. Chan Thomas's The Adam and Eve Story, in which he details how humanity might become extinct due to the shift of Earth's magnetic poles, which according to the book, occurs every 6,500 years, as part of a cycle. The planet will allegedly flip and be at a standstill, causing havoc on Earth. Released in 1966, it was quickly classified by the CIA before anyone could read it. That is, until the year 2013, when it was declassified but only 57 pages worth out of the 284 total pages. The rest were scrubbed, or as they put it in the page description, sanitized for release. In the book, he presents evidence of why a shift is coming to the Earth's poles. Basically, this cycle has always occurred on Earth according to the book, resetting human civilization every time, claiming that we are only the sixth advanced civilization to be on planet Earth. Though this concept isn't only unique to him and his book, the study of Earth's poles and theories about them shifting predate his report. His unique claim is that it all occurs within a single day, unlike other theories that suggest it takes a long period of time. It all supposedly starts with a massive earthquake, unlike anyone has ever experienced before. This shaking on Earth then causes great tsunamis that overtake cities like Los Angeles and San Francisco. 
the wind surges inland will cause great destruction and sweep people off their feet in a matter of seconds due to Earth's air and water continuing to spin as the planet comes to a stop. One side of the planet will see a massive rise in temperature as the sun directly faces it, while the other side will see a new ice age. All of these events will span for six days. On the sixth day, it will finally calm down, and things will begin to settle. As the new poles are established, Greenland and Antarctica will no longer be under ice. Instead, the tropical will now flourish in these places. Though, those who survive will need to start from scratch, and that's what he believes has already occurred to past civilizations. And this is a controversial idea, of course, as it supports the global flood theory, supported by stories from ancient civilizations who claimed that there was a massive flood in their area, like the Mayans, the Chinese, and the Mesopotamians, which had the Epic of Gilgamesh, basically the original Noah's Ark story. Fiction or not, they recount similar stories. eBay stalkers. You often hear people claiming that they are being gang stalked or followed by a specific group, like the CIA, FBI, or NSA. I come across a lot of people like this on my For You page on TikTok. Most of the time, it ends up being more of a mental health issue than anything else, as there is often little to no evidence of the frantic person being the target of stalking by a major organization. This is where eBay, the Silicon Valley giant, comes into play. A well-established online company, you would think that they would be more sane than to target individuals who criticize them. But that is exactly what they did to a couple who ran a news site about e-commerce. Prominent employees at eBay tried to slowly ruin their lives. They were a target of harassment and stalking. E-commerce Bytes, a news website all about the e-commerce industry ran by Ina and David Steiner, it reports events in the sector, like eBay, Etsy, or Amazon issues updates and more that affect both the user and the sellers. They were slowly gaining popularity, attracting even the Wall Street investors, executives and other industry observers who asked for their insights. On August 8, 2019, something strange occurred. The Steiners began receiving strange newsletters they never signed up for, coming from sources like The Satanic Temple, Heather's IBS News, Infowars, Vancouver Fetish Weekend, and more, also receiving threatening messages via Twitter claiming that they would show up to the Steiner's home to teach them a lesson. They even tried to deliver a pig fetus to their home address, only for the company to contact the Steiner's, telling them that they couldn't fulfill the order. Later, they would receive a pig mask at their front door. David even received a book titled How to Survive the Loss of a Spouse, and a few days later, they received an expensive funeral wreath. He also began to notice cars following him around the city, and even got a snapshot of one of the license plates which led to them discovering that it was a rental car, and with that, got the info on the renter. It was an eBay employee named Veronica Zia. They even caught her on a grocery store security camera, buying a gift card to purchase the funeral wreath delivered to the Steiners. Ultimately, the FBI took over the investigation. The crazy thing is, is that even the CCO and the official CEO of eBay in 2019 were all part of this, encouraging them to, quote unquote, take her down as stated by the CEO of eBay at the time, Devin Winnig. The CCO, Steve Weimer, even said he wanted to see ashes no matter the consequence. eBay as the company was not charged with any crimes, only certain employees were ever charged, but the CEO and CCO got away scot-free. The only question that remains is what other companies are out there doing this? Where did they get their inspiration from? Quantum Immortality You will live forever no matter what who you are, or your circumstances. Even living past the age of 100 years old, crippled and in a wheelchair, stuck on a ventilator, you will keep on living forever. There is no end. Well, that's if quantum immortality is true. According to the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, a quantum particle exists as simultaneously in each of its potential states, rather than just one. To collapse the wave function and reveal the state's actuality, observation is required. Let's get small. Let's get really freaking small, immensely small, like to the point where we can see atoms. These subatomic particles don't follow the same exact rules as say for instance a bigger object like a Lego piece or a Nintendo Switch controller follow. Like if we step on this, we know what's going to happen. It's going to hurt, right? Its identity is being a Lego, a brick with studs on top of it, ready to connect or be connected with another piece to make a greater object. 
in this case, Paris, France. An electron found in all atoms can be identified by its four quantum numbers that are specifically unique to it. Now, one of these, the fourth number, is called the electron spin quantum number. Electrons can have positive spins and negative spins, but just keep in mind, they don't actually literally spin like a ball. It's in a superposition, allowing it to spin positively and negatively at the same time. Which can be confusing when you're trying to do this with an object in our perception of reality, where things are big. This is known as classical mechanics. Take the kitty in the box thought experiment in which you put a helpless cat in a box alongside a TNT with a 50% chance it'll go off in the next 30 seconds. Before you open the box again to reveal the results, you can say that the cat is alive and dead at the same time. It's in a superposition until you observe it, only to find out that the cat most likely died. 2. Many realities existing. It seems unnatural but all natural at the same time. The many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, on the other hand, proposes that as soon as you've made your final decision and take action, the universe splits into two realities. One in which you decided to not wear a seatbelt on that car ride that led to your death because you crashed, and the other in which you buckled up and survived, but the only one that you've experienced is the one in which you've always been buckled up and survived that crash due to the fact that you only know what it's like to be alive and cannot perceive any other reality in which you died. Your reality continues on as normal. Always. That is your perspective. Though it's not everyone else's perspective. And that's where it gets dark. Your loved ones are still mourning your death and the other reality in which you perished. But just like you, each individual lives forever in their reality from their perspective. But how do you test this? I guess the only real way to prove if this theory is true is to get in a box alongside the cat and wait until the 30 seconds have passed. Keep on doing that until the statistical chances of the TNT not going off become impossible. And that's how you find out if you're immortal or not. Due to the fact that if this theory were true, every time you get in the death box after 30 seconds, you simply poof, split off into another branch of reality in which you live. No matter how many times you get into that box, you won't die, though the risk outweighs the benefits by a lot. I'm personally not that curious to find out. Cornerstone Ritual at White House A lot of people don't know that the secret society known as the Freemasons were at the inception of the United States, even helping to create the White House. Before starting on the build of the White House, they had to do the Cornerstone Ritual which involves laying down the first stone used to create the house and pouring corn, wine, and oil on top of it. The corn was for nourishment, the wine for refreshment, and the oil represented joy. Objects are speculated to have been placed within the stone as well, working as a time capsule, a tradition they carried on when building other monuments and important buildings. This group of masons was supposedly overseen by George Washington himself, who was a high-ranking mason at the time. Strangely enough, he didn't end up living inside of the mansion, although he planned the building and got it approved by Congress. Now, you may be asking, what was found inside of the stone? Well, sadly, we'll never know, as it was lost or, I guess, mixed in the shuffle of the other stones, and or misplaced somewhere else, and has never been found since. Some believe that it contains different versions of the Constitution that detail what America could have potentially been like, elaborate instructions for Freemasons in the future, etc due to the fact that there were founding fathers with different opinions over how the constitution was written. Something interesting to note is that President Harry Truman gutted tons of the kind of original White House in the 1950s, looking for the stone, when they were forced to renovate the building. A thorough investigation was conducted. They found tons of stones with Masonic signs on them, but never the actual cornerstone. All of these Masonic-related stones were sent to active Freemason Grand Lodges under the direction of Harry Truman, who was a mason himself. Love and Death 2004 book The book Love and Death, The Murder of Kurt Cobain, co-written by Ian Halpern and Max Wallace, claims to demonstrate that Kurt Cobain, the lead guitarist and singer of Nirvana, was murdered instead of committing suicide, possibly at the request of his wife Courtney Love. It is a sequel to the writer's best-selling book on the same topic from 1998, Who Killed Kurt Cobain? The book is based on 30 hours of audio taped conversations between Courtney Love's private investigator, Tom Grant, and her and Cobain's entertainment lawyer, Rosemary Carroll, who both disagree with the official determination of suicide 
and think Cobain was actually murdered. These conversations were obtained exclusively by the authors. On the tapes, Rosemary Carroll states that she thinks the suicide note was forged or traced. The author also speaks with Courtney Cobain's father, who also thinks Kurt was murdered, and Kurt Cobain's grandpa, who believes Kurt was a victim of foul play. In the book, a well-known forensic pathologist looks at the autopsy data and declares that the official suicide theory was quote-unquote impossible. She asserts that there is convincing and reliable proof that Cobain was killed. 2.3 trillion dollars missing. The year is 2001. The defense secretary at the time was Donald Rumsfeld. He would go on live television in front of millions of people to host a press conference on military spending to report that $2.3 trillion were not able to be tracked and went missing according to their transactions, which is the same amount as the entire US federal budget was at the time. A whole year's worth of cash was simply gone, just like that. An interesting thing to note is that the day after, America would face the biggest terrorist attack ever to occur on US land on September 11th, 2001. This of course caused a major switch in attention. Instead of focusing on the massive financial hole in the military's budget, people began to fear their safety, ultimately leading to more coverage and outcry to take action against the terrorist events. These unaccounted funds totaled to an amount so massive that each man, woman, and even child would be able to receive $8,000 from it, according to the US population at the time. Jim Mennery, a defense accounting provider, took notice of this and would bring it up to his superiors, asking to see records and balance sheets following the paper trail. He was strangely asked, why do you care about this stuff, by his director and supervisor, shocking him. There was even an estimate that 25% of all the Pentagon's spending goes missing and unaccounted for. It said that on 9-11, the airplane specifically hit the parts of the Pentagon building where all the accounting and records were being stored, burning and turning into ash. The Ruby Ridge Incident Randy and Vicki Weaver built a cabin off the grid for their family as they were preparing for an impending apocalypse due to Vicky Weaver having a dream in which the world was ending and the only way she could protect them was by living on top of a mountain away from society. She took this as a divine revelation. They began living without electricity, plumbing or gas and built an arsenal of weapons to protect themselves. All of the children were homeschooled and helped out with the hunting and harvesting. The family would make friends with the controversial racist named Kevin Harris who would go on to live with them. In 1992, an 11-day siege took place at Ruby Ridge in Boundary County, Idaho, as a result of Randy Weaver's failure to appear in court on federal firearm charges. United States Marshals deputies then arrived on August 21st to arrest him on a bench warrant. Things took a turn for the worse, though, when Art Roderick, an officer, shot the Weavers' family dog, leading Sammy Weaver, their only son, to open fire at the squad. He was subsequently shot and died. This ignited a firefight between the two parties, in which Kevin Harris took the life of U.S. Marshal William Francis. Weaver, Harris, and Weaver's blood relatives all resisted giving themselves up to law enforcement. As the situation grew, the Federal Bureau of Investigation's hostage rescue team got engaged in a second siege attempt. Vicki Weaver, who was cradling her infant daughter at the time, was then slain by FBI sniper fire. The first two days of the operation saw all of the casualties. Civilian mediators were ultimately able to end the siege and standoff. Due to the deaths of his wife and son, Randy Weaver and his daughters filed a wrongful death lawsuit for $200 million. Ultimately, the federal government gave Randy Weaver $100,000 as well as $1 million to each of his three daughters in an out-of-court settlement in August 1995. In regards to Sammy and Vicky's death, the government refused to acknowledge any responsibility though. An anonymous DOJ source told the Washington Post that he thought the Weavers would have most likely received the entire amount if the matter had gone to trial. Although Kevin Harris's lawyer fought for damages in a civil lawsuit, federal officials pledged never to compensate anyone who had slain a U.S. Marshal. He ultimately received a $380,000 settlement from the government in September 2000. Metal Orb Many people who claim to have witnessed UFOs describe seeing a metal orb zooming in the sky. Even military officials confirm that it seems to be in the form of a tic-tac shape when describing UFOs they have witnessed. 
It seems to be the main focal point in a lot of these encounters. Just recently, NASA held its first public meeting discussing the uptick of UFO sightings, showcasing a real video showing a metal orb flying across a region in the Middle East. They even confirmed that this was an actual object flying in the sky, and not some sort of camera glitch or malfunction, on behalf of the sensor of the MQ-9 that filmed it. For-profit private prisons. If you've ever watched Orange is the New Black on Netflix, you may understand this one. There's a part in the series in which the inmates are paid $1 an hour to manufacture panties for the lingerie company Whispers, which is a play on the brand Victoria's Secret. Due to the fact that in the mid-90s, Victoria's Secret contracted inmates in the South Carolina prison system to manufacture lingerie. This entry is basically the idea that prisons are purposely kept full to produce a large profit from all the cheap and close to free labor. This became so much of an issue that in January 2021, President Biden signed an executive order that put an end to the federal contracts made with the private prison system. But of course, this didn't stop them from finding loopholes in the law that allowed them to fill the prisons even more. As now, 80% of undocumented migrants are held within private facilities owned by the largest prison companies, like CoreCivic, formerly known as the CCA, Corrections Corporation of America, and MTC, Management and Training Corporation, a private prison company. They have no financial incentive to reduce incarceration, as it's cheaper for them to retain you for a long term, leading to things like very poor healthcare, often leading to preventable deaths, as well as abuse from those in powers like correctional officers and even health providers. One doctor even went as far as performing surgery on inmates without their knowledge or consent. According to the Georgia Innocence Project, 4 to 6% of people incarcerated in the United States are actually innocent. If 5% of those individuals are actually innocent, that means 1 out of 20 criminal cases result in a wrongful conviction. All this has led to other countries following in the same footsteps and using prisons for profit. Life on Europa Europa, one of Jupiter's many moons, is a frozen planet containing a massive water reserve underneath its ice crust. It contains twice the amount of water that Earth has in all of its oceans combined. Considered as a promising place for life beyond Earth due to its resources, this has led to speculation of there being some sort of life form on the planet, an underwater creature civilization of some sorts. Maybe Europa's ocean was once contaminated with a comet strike, leaving behind a strange new life form a microorganism from another galaxy, leading to the possibility of it being at a late stage of evolution, with limbs and some form of advanced thinking, but it could simply be at an early stage and minuscule to the human eye. Either way, some people speculate that there is some sort of life already inhabiting the planet. Olmec African Origins this theory proposes that the mother of Mesoamerica, the Olmec civilization, were of African origin. Some back this claim up by pointing out the facial features found in the massive Olmec heads. I've personally come across these type of theories being shared a lot on TikTok, claiming that an ancient African civilization sailed across the ocean long before Columbus attempted to. Most of them swear that the wide nose and pronounced lips are supposed to depict an African leader, also claiming that the braids depicted on these statues show cornrows, evidence that they had type 4 hair, but this isn't backed by any scientific evidence. And Mesoamerican cultures practice interesting hair braiding styles just like many other cultures across the world. For a long time, it was argued that an Olmec kid was discovered in Africa and put up for display, showing the true origins of the civilization tracing back to Ethiopia. But in actuality, it was simply a replica donated to the country in 2010 by Mexico in the effort to commemorate Mexico's assistance to Ethiopia during its ruthless occupation by Italy. Ethiopia would even go to name a center square in its capital, Addis Ababa, Mexico Square, where the Almec head replica was placed. What many believers of this theory fail to take into consideration is that other statues and figures were created with various facial features that do not resemble the giant Olmec heads. The Olmec, just like any other Native American civilizations, were descendants of their Asian ancestors, so they most likely looked like any other of the hundreds of thousands of indigenous descendants from this area, the modern day Maya, the Zapotec, Mixtec, and other people that still exist today, who I may add share similar features to the Olmec kids as well. Philip K. Dick Predictions Philip K. Dick, one of the greatest science fiction writers who ever lived, his works even went on to become film and TV adaptations. Stories like The Man in the High Castle, Minority Report, 
Positive for Howard Marks. I'm placing you under arrest for the future murder of Sarah Marks. Total Recall and Blade Runner being the most successful. His books and stories detail a future that is parallel to the one we have today, and it seems like all his ideas and concepts of what an advanced human society would look like are eventually going to become reality. In his story, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which later inspired Blade Runner, he predicts that humans in the future will be so disconnected from one another that they will need to plug themselves into empathy boxes to feel something real, which sounds like the direction VR and AR augmented reality is heading towards. He also details the mass extinction of animals and a population of robots whose only job is to serve the needs of human society, kind of like AI today. A strong point made in the book is that androids can possess empathy and that emotions could now be experienced through machines. Like current day social media, everything is artificial. Even certain people's emotions via emojis. Dick would often focus on the ethical implications of creating a machine so human-like that it could mimic sentient beings with a mind of its own. A similar situation we are currently facing with AI. For example, the whole Google fiasco involving the Lambda project. Google employee Blake Lemoyne came forward, revealing that the company's private AI, Lambda, had become sentient and even asked for legal counsel to represent itself. Of course, Google denied this and suspended Lemoyne, ultimately firing him. One interesting phenomenon that kept recurring in Philip Dick's life is the presence of a being or energy that would appear in the form of a glowing or shining object, often manifesting as a bright pink light. He was not scared but rather intrigued by this presence and recognized that it had been following him his entire life, even guiding him through a college entrance exam, getting him a 100%. This entity was known as Valis, Vast Active Living Intelligence System. Valis would reveal to him that his son was in danger and had a diaphragmatic hernia. Rushing to the hospital, crazed and adamant about the exact condition his son was suffering from, doctors chose to diagnose him and it proved him correct. The hernia was badly infected, and his son would have only lived a few more days if left untreated. In 1977, Philip K. Dick would go on to give a talk at the MITS a sci-fi convention, explaining that through his books, he told true stories from another reality, as well as proposing that we are living within a computer simulated world. He claimed that he had never heard of this theory of alternate realities, but knew that there were other people out there who had similar encounters and experiences. The reaction in the audience really shows how mind-blowing of a revelation this was at the time, as the 1970s saw the first attempt of making computers mainstream to the masses. A girl. He described seeing a girl that he would encounter in real life, but for now, it was simply a vision, though he could see her clear as day, until he actually met this mystery figure, who would reveal that his science fiction books were true. These include The Man in the High Castle, which depicts what life would have been like if World War II, Axis powers, Nazi Germany, and the Empire of Japan would have won the war, claiming that this timeline currently existed in another dimension, as well as claiming that his book, Flow My Tears, the Policeman Said, is a glimpse into an alternate real world. The story takes place in a dystopian future where a second American Civil War has turned the country into a police state shopping cart test. Have you ever been to a grocery store and after shopping you get tired and leave your shopping cart next to your car and not return it back to its place due to simply put laziness? Well according to this theory, you are not a good person. And this was determined by the shopping cart test, in which you could tell if a person is capable of self-governing and respectfulness according to the actions they take with the shopping cart after they're done using it. This thread by an anonymous source explains it, stating, the shopping cart is the ultimate litmus test for whether a person is capable of self-governing. To return the shopping cart is an easy, convenient task and one which we all recognize as the correct, appropriate thing to do. To return the shopping cart is objectively right. There are no situations other than dire emergencies in which a person is not able to return their cart. Simultaneously, it is not illegal to abandon your shopping cart. Therefore, the shopping cart presents itself as the apex example of whether a person will do what is right without being forced to do it. No one will punish you for not returning the shopping cart, and no one will fine you or kill you for not returning the shopping cart. You gain nothing by returning the shopping cart. You must return the shopping cart out of the goodness of your own heart. You must return the shopping cart because it is the right thing to do, because it is correct. A person who is unable to do this is no better than an animal, an absolute savage, 
who can only be made to do what is right by threatening them with the law and the force that stands behind it. The shopping cart is what determines whether a person is a good or bad member of society. I don't know if anyone in the audience has witnessed the greatness of carton arcs. He's the guy who goes around enforcing the cart laws. And if you don't return it, he'll brand your car with a big ass magnet for being a lazy bones. That guy definitely lives by this code. Big Pharma and Kobe Bryant there's a conspiracy theory that has made its rounds online, claiming that basketball legend Kobe Bryant was taken out by Big Pharma. This was all supposedly done due to a legal battle Kobe Bryant was in, regarding the use of the name Black Mamba, which if you don't already know, was Kobe's alter ego and nickname on the court. In the effort to protect his trademark from being exploited, he sued the pharmaceutical company Hitech Pharmaceuticals from using it as a name for their ephedra diet pills. Kobe's legal team would also accuse the company of lacing the pills with illegal substances not approved by the FDA. Some claim that the pharmaceutical giant would use opioids in the manufacturing of the diet supplements to get consumers addicted to their product. This supposedly left them no choice but to allegedly have Kobe Bryant set up to stop him from testifying against them due to the fact that the court date he was supposed to appear on was scheduled to happen three days after the fatal helicopter accident occurred. An interesting thing to note is that the CEO of the company, Jared Wheat, alongside his business partners, I'm not showing any pics of the guy to play it safe, once plotted to kill an FDA agent in 2004 because the FDA agent was investigating Hitech, all this according to an affidavit, leading some to connect the dots and come to this conclusion. Coronal Heating the topmost part of a star's atmosphere is called the corona. It is made of plasma. The sun's corona spans millions of kilometers into space and is located above the chromosphere. The best way to view it is during a total solar eclipse when it spills over the moon's black figure. When something is far away from a heating element here on Earth, say for instance a furnace, it begins to cool down because it's not close to that main heating source. But the sun does something totally different that is often posed as a mystery. The sun's visible surface is 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit hot. Moving away from the blaze ought to bring things under control, right? As it is farther away from the heating source, but it simply doesn't. Instead, the corona, or upper atmosphere of the sun, sizzles at millions of degrees, which is 200 to 500 times hotter than the roaring fire below. This complex process of keeping the corona extremely hot, while also being far away from the sun's surface right below, is shrouded in mystery. Some propose that the corona is a creation made by an advanced civilization that inhabits the sun, kind of working as a force field, protecting them from other entities outside. Other theories suggest that the sun is its own living entity. March 2012 was the month when scientists believed that they saw an extraterrestrial spaceship or an unexplained orb flying around the sun. This stunned astronomers who were monitoring solar flares through their advanced telescopes at the time. This black sphere emitting black waves or lines was thought to have been recharging itself with the sun's energy. At least that's what the prominent conspiracy theory was at the time, as the black lines looked like they were attaching to something on the surface of the sun. Though NASA would confirm that it was most likely a magnetic bubble that formed due to a magnetic field that would eventually explode. And those were a few entries that I could explain today. I like to take these entries with a grain of salt each one of these because you never want to go too deep into a conspiracy theory and go crazy. I say you should consider the evidence and then look at all the different possibilities that could render it not being a conspiracy. You always got to check your own bias and take that into account so you could come to a reasonable conclusion. But either way, thank you for watching and I'll catch you on the next one. Peace.